American Catholic History is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Hello and welcome to American Catholic History. If you like our podcast, be sure to rate us and give us a review wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Today we're talking about Venerable Pierre Toussaint, who is the only layperson interred in the crypt of St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City. Right. Apart from him, that crypt is all clerics, and nearly all are the past archbishops of New York. But Toussaint's beginnings didn't suggest he'd end up in such a remarkable place. Tell us about his early life. Uh, Now, before I do that, I have two disclaimers. First, different sources give us different dates and times for parts of Toussaint's life. So we chose those dates that seem to be most agreed upon and give the most coherent timeline. Also, I want to apologize for how badly I'm going to mangle some French pronunciation in this episode. Okay, so that said, Pierre Toussaint was born in 1766 in the French colony of Saint-Domingue, which is present-day Haiti. His mother was a slave on the plantation of Jean and Marie Berard. While most slaves in Haiti worked in the brutal conditions of the sugar fields, Pierre and his sister Rosalie were trained as house slaves, and their masters taught them to read and write. Pierre was even given access to the plantation library, where he learned French by reading books of sermons. This reading also had the effect of instilling in him a deep Catholic faith. It's funny how that works. So in 1787, the political situation in Saint-Domingue was becoming dangerous, as slaves in the fields were beginning to agitate against their masters. So Jean Berard moved his wife, sisters, and a group of five slaves to New York City. Pierre and his sister were among those slaves who went. Once in New York, Pierre was made an apprentice to one of the best hairdressers in New York, and he learned the craft of coiffure. Which in this case meant doing hair up with ribbons and elaborate arrangements like you see in paintings of 18th and early 19th century women. It's interesting that he was sent to learn to be a hairdresser. It was one of the very few trades open to blacks at the time, and he got really good at it. So so good, in fact, that he became an in-demand hairdresser among the upper class of New York City. He would travel around town on foot because a black man wasn't allowed to use the public transportation or taxis to the houses of high society getting paid well to do ladies' hair for up to 16 hours each day. In 1791, as the unrest in Saint-Domingue was turning into open rebellion, Monsieur Berard returned there to see to the plantation's survival. Unfortunately, he died of pneumonia shortly after arriving, and the plantation was destroyed in the revolution. At the same time, his business interest in New York collapsed, and Madame Barard was suddenly a penniless widow in New York City. This was when Pierre's time to shine began. He was in his 20s and was making enough money as a hairdresser that he could have purchased his own freedom. But he chose to remain a slave so that he could take care of Madame Barard. Indeed, he did. He cared about Madame Barard as a person and believed it was his Christian duty to stand by her and take care of her. He encouraged her to accept invitations to society parties and to host some herself. He would return from his clients' homes in time to do her hair and would always bring some surprise to lift her spirits. He knew that she would never accept his assistance if he were a free man, so he voluntarily remained in the state of slavery. Few realized the arrangement, thinking Pierre was nothing more than a talented and devoted house servant, but it was actually his earnings that kept Madame Berard from destitution. This continued even after she remarried. Right. Her new husband, Monsieur Gabriel Nicolas, a fellow emigre from Saint-Domingue, was a musician. At the time, prudish religious types were getting the theaters and music halls closed down, so his opportunities to make a living were limited. So Pierre supported the household until Madame Barard, now Madame Nicolas, died in 1811. Right. So he would go out and do ladies' hair during the day, then come home in time to serve the family at table and play music for them in the evening. Shortly before Madame Nicolas died at just 32 years old, she, her husband, and Pierre went to the French consulate where the Nicolases manumitted Pierre, that is, freed him. So in 1807, at 41 years old, Pierre was a free man. Pierre began to make changes in his life. First, he chose Toussaint as his last name in honor of the leader of the revolution in Saint-Domingue. Second, he purchased his sister's freedom so she could be free to marry. And then he began saving the money to purchase the freedom of the woman he loved, Juliette Noel, who was 20 years his junior and had also been brought as a slave from Saint-Domingue. Four years later, he did purchase her freedom, and they were married in 1811. Pierre and Juliette Toussaint would actually continue to live at the Nicolas' house for four years, 
but as live-in servants rather than slaves, until Nicolas moved out of town. They adopted Pierre's niece Euphemia after his sister Rosalie died of tuberculosis. But some things didn't change, like going to Mass every morning at 6 a.m. Right, at St. Peter's Church on Barclay Street, which was the first Catholic parish in the state of New York, and it was where Pierre and Juliette were married. That's also the parish to which Father Peter Wayland, 50 years later, would appeal for help when he was a prisoner of war on Governor's Island. More on that in episode 31. Right. Also, while Pierre was still a slave, he had begun helping others who had fled to New York from Saint-Domingue, especially freed slaves, since he had the means and connections to help, and he spoke their language as well as English. As a free man and with the assistance of his wife, this service expanded to helping them find jobs. Because his work as a hairdresser gave him the opportunity to establish warm relationships with many of the wealthiest and most influential people in New York City. Sure, because he wasn't just a hairdresser to them, he became a confidant and a counselor. He would engage in pleasant conversation, tell stories, and speak with his clients of the goodness and love of God and of his Catholic faith. Now, this wasn't a small matter because so many of the wealthy were rather anti-Catholic, but they didn't mind because he was such a good man, had such a gentle way about him, he had a quick wit, and very importantly, he was utterly discreet. Many even referred to him as our St. Pierre. So when he found someone in need, he was able to use his connections to help. But the Toussaints did so much more on top of that. They really did. They became great philanthropists. They arranged a credit agency to help immigrants and freed slaves. They crossed barricades and quarantine lines during epidemics to nurse those afflicted. They visited people in prison to give counsel and aid. They helped to fund the construction of the first Catholic school for black children in New York City at St. Vincent de Paul Parish. They even helped to build that church. They helped to fund a school for black children in Baltimore run by the Oblate Sisters of Providence, which was the first religious order for black women in the United States. They also co-founded an orphanage in New York City with Mother Elizabeth Ann Seton. Mother Seton, of course, would become the first native-born American to be canonized. And they were major benefactors and fundraisers for the new Catholic cathedral on Mulberry Street, known today as the Basilica of St. Patrick's Old Cathedral. Later in life, they even assisted with the fundraising for the new and current St. Patrick's Cathedral on Fifth Avenue. Once Mr. Nicholas left town and the Toussaints bought their own home, they took in many more orphans along with Euphemia, and they started a school to educate these youths and other black youths in trades. They just never tired of helping others their entire lives together. Now, mind you, this was at a time when black people were still subject to slavery and were viewed by white society as being inferior. Pierre remembered the time that an usher at St. Patrick's Cathedral, a church he had helped to build, had objected loudly to a black man being in the congregation. And while slavery was outlawed in New York in 1827, he was not blind to how many of his black brothers and sisters still lived in bondage. He was not blind to the injustices all around him and those that he endured, but he just did not let that make him bitter. He once said, I am a Catholic. I receive the Eucharist. I receive the Divine Lord. I am not bitter toward anyone. I recognize what has been done to me. I recognize how I am treated here. But that is not enough to make me bitter any more than Christ was bitter on the cross. Indeed, it was Christ who cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Pierre and Juliet worked together helping others for 40 years until Juliet's death in 1851. She was buried in the graveyard of St. Patrick's Cathedral next to Euphemia, who had died of tuberculosis when she was 14. Pierre would join them two years later, dying on June 30th, 1853, at 87 years old. When he was nearing the end of his life, he was asked why he didn't retire. He said, because if he retired, he wouldn't have money to give to the poor. Upon his death, the newspapers were full of articles about how much good he had done and all of the charitable causes he had supported. And because of his great philanthropy and goodness, his name and deeds are remembered in settings both sacred and secular. On the secular side, when Gracie Mansion, the official residence of the mayor of New York City, was redecorated in 2015, portraits of Pierre and Juliette Toussaint were among those selected to hang in the mansion as a way to show the history of the city and the diversity of those who had done great things in years gone by. From the sacred side, Pierre Toussaint's cause for canonization was opened in 1968 after the John Boyle O'Reilly Committee for Interracial Justice began to publicize stories about him. In 1991, John Cardinal O'Connor, Archbishop of New York, had the Servant of God's remains exhumed and reinterred in the crypt beneath the altar of St. Patrick's Cathedral on Fifth Avenue. This space is generally reserved for the bishops of the archdiocese. 
he is the only layman buried there. In 1996, Pope St. John Paul II officially recognized that Toussaint had lived a life of heroic virtue and declared him venerable. The next step, beatification, requires a miracle, and the Vatican has one that they're looking into. So, no matter which way you look at it, Pierre Toussaint was a great man, who, God willing, will one day be all of our St. Pierre. You've been listening to American Catholic History on the StarQuest Production Network. If you've been enjoying our podcast, please be sure to give us a rating and a review. To learn more about today's topic, to find previous episodes, and to send feedback, please visit sqpn.com slash history. You can email us at history at sqpn.com or find us on social media at facebook.com slash American Catholic History or follow StarQuest on Twitter at sqpn. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History on StarQuest. Quest.